Hello and welcome to Maiden Mother Matriarch with me, Louise Perry. My guest today is Jennifer Lal, a former paediatric critical care nurse turned campaigner, writer and documentary filmmaker and in particular campaigner against the surrogate industry, which is the main focus of our discussion today. We spoke about how the surrogate industry has changed over time, uh, the various health risks involved in going through with surrogacy and also in, in egg harvesting, and why businesses who offer their young female employees uh, egg freezing packages definitely don't have their women's best interests at heart. As always, you can find Maiden Mother Matriarch on Substack at louiseperry.substack.com, where you can also find bonus episodes, extended episodes, and the MMM chat community. You can also give gift subscriptions to any friends or family who you think would, um, would resonate with what we're doing here. Thank you so much. So am I right, Jennifer, that it used to be the case in the very early days of surrogacy, so we're talking many decades ago now, that so-called traditional surrogacy was more typical, where the surrogate mother would also be the egg donor. So she would be biologically, in every possible sense, the mother. Whereas now it's much more common to have an, a combination of an egg donor and a surrogate and, you know, maybe another woman who's a legal parent, and you end up with some much stranger arrangements often, um, and sometimes sometimes actually really, really bizarre um, surrogacy, surrogacy arrangements that, that hit the headlines. Yeah, I mean, when you look at um, surrogacy in the U.S., the very first big high-profile surrogacy case was the case of Mary Beth Whitehead and the famous baby M, and Mary Beth Whitehead was the egg provider and the womb provider of that arrangement. It was a commercial arrangement. She was paid. Mary Beth was to literally sell her own biological child. Um, and in the U.S., it was that case that actually got some of our 50 states to actually start implementing um, you know, laws around the different states. So at that time, like New York State banned commercial surrogacy um, New Jersey was another state, Michigan, because it was such a high profile case that we'd never really seen this kind of um, thing happening in the tension that it provided. I mean, what happened with Mary Beth was once she surrendered the baby, she had an enormous regret. Um, so and then the first big legal case in the United States was with a, an African-American woman who was just the gestational surrogate. And when when she gave birth to the child, she was sort of under the impression that she would be able to keep updates and, and find out how the baby's doing and, you know, maybe get pictures now and again. She didn't want to, she didn't want the child, but she wanted to be sort of involved in knowing how the child was doing. Um, and that was a, a case in California that the California Supreme Court ruled that she had no maternal rights, um, that she was just the womb um, and she, so she was not recognized um, as a mother. It was interesting because one of the justices in the California case who wrote the dissenting opinion on that case did recognize that if not for this gestational surrogate, and I hate using calling women gestational anything, mm -hmm. um, if not for this woman, this child would not have existed. So we can't just ignore the fact that this woman was part of the equation. Um, but I think because of the legal complexities what what we call traditional surrogacy, which I don't like the word, it's nothing traditional about it, um, is where the woman actually provides her own egg and her womb. And so the shift has happened um, to gestational surrogacy, especially as we've had mo more same-sex male couples. You know, they always get the egg from one woman and the womb from another. And it's, a you know, it's, it's making that three-legged stool, you know, that the men are one leg, the egg donor is one leg, and the womb, it, womb provider is the other leg. And it makes the case that the, the men are the legal parents of the child. In California, most people don't realize a surrogate waives her maternal rights before she's even pregnant. So it's not once she's confirmed to be pregnant, it's not after she's given birth that the maternal rights are legally severed. It's before, usually at the time of her signing the contract and entering into a commercial arrange, arrangement to be a surrogate mother. There's a push in the UK at the moment towards um, comparable reforms that would very much sort of load the dice in favour of the 
um, uh, intended parents is the term that's normally used in the industry, isn't it? The people who the people who want to be legally parents of the child and who are stumping up the money. Um, there's very much a push in the UK towards towards giving them more rights in terms of having not having to go through the adoption process, which you do at the moment, where after the child is born, they are legally the the the, the mother is the surrogate mother. Um, and they have to go through the adoption process, which can be quite lengthy. And of course, it means that the surrogate mother has much more power to change her mind and um, retain custody of the child if she if she wants to. And no one in the surrogacy industry wants that to happen. So, <laughs> um, wow. yeah, the the um, the uh, Californian model is what most proponents of surrogacy would wish for. Um, but at the moment, am I right? We have a that we have an enormous range of different legal approaches to surrogacy across different countries. Yeah, it's it's really like a patchwork quilt, and that on one hand encourages the tourism. You know, you travel to a more friendly. Um, you know, it's where can I buy eggs? Because some countries it's illegal to pay women for their eggs. Um, you know, there's some countries that have you know we have several states in the u.s that are just silent the law is silent so it's not seen as a um a, a place where big fertility i call it big fertility wants to set up shop because there's no legal framework to um, protect the the purchasing parents whoever they might be so you know as um you know i actually testified to the uk law commission during covid it was an online zoom hearing and my colleague who's in england gary powell who works with me he happens to be a gay man who full stop up opposes opposes surrogacy he and i spoke to the the law commission um and you know i kept saying i'm in california and everybody says be like california it's working grand out there and i say no we've had we've had surrogate mothers in california die um so uh, i don't know why you want to you know model your legislation after california surrogate mothers and egg sellers have zero rights or protections. And I'm not one that's going to argue that we need to protect them and give them rights. I want to argue that we shouldn't be doing this at all uh, because it's it's harmful and it's dangerous. I mean, my own uh, colleagues and I published our own research. We interviewed um, 92 gestational surrogates in America and took them through a very rigorous peer-reviewed study. And I want to say it's the first of its kind research. You always are kind of cautious because then somebody finds some, somebody else has done it. But we have quite a bit of studies in the medical literature that shows that surrogate pregnancies are much higher risk um, and much more higher rates of complications to mother and child. And what our, our research did, which was unique, is we took these 92 women and we asked them the same questions for their own pregnancies with their own children and then with the surrogate pregnancies. And we, in our research, mirrored what's already out there about these high-risk surrogate pregnancies when they otherwise had natural pregnancies with that were uncomplicated. And our research showed that they had higher rates of postpartum depression, where women who went home with their own children didn't have the high rates of uh, postpartum depression as they did with their surrogate pregnancies, which kind of makes sense when you think about this whole nine-month pregnancy and then you go home, you know, with your, your job is done and you're children are going where's the baby oh yeah the, your body must think the baby's died like that that yeah that uh, the, the depression makes complete sense um yeah. i didn't know that though about the other other risks of complications do we know why that is um i i would say a couple things one is i mean if you just there's plenty in the medical literature about women who use donor eggs for pregnancy. So say you're a 45 year old woman and you want to conceive and you say, well, I'm going to get donor eggs. So there's a lot in the literature that women who do that kind of a scenario to conceive have higher rates of preeclampsia, of maternal hypertension, because it's a foreign egg. You're putting a foreign body in this, <gasps> in this woman's body. So it's and not so even just, rejection. not even just from being 45. It's no, that plus. Exactly. She could be a 30 year old woman who for some reason has no ovarian reserve. You know, she just went through early menopause as a young woman. Um, so it's the same thing. The surrogate is pregnant with donor eggs. I mean, it's a donor embryo. You know, it's an embryo that's made from donor eggs. So her body immediately sees this as a foreign um you know, object in her body. Um, there are also higher rates of complications because it's not uncommon for a surrogate to be asked to um, carry, you know, twins or triplets, which automatically confer a higher risk pregnancy because of that. But just even in our research and other medical um, publications, 
even women carrying a single birth, singleton, as a surrogate, as a gestational surrogate, will have these complications. Now, they often can be managed, um, but, you know, and then it gets into asking questions, but should we even be putting otherwise healthy women who should be home tending to their own children in these kind of high risk situations, especially when we're offering the money? I mean, the whole money layer, um, and that's one of the, the debates happening in the United Kingdom right now, is on the you know, the reimbursement and what can surrogates be be paid, even though your model in the United Kingdom is an altruistic model, there's still a lot of money that surrogates make because they're reimbursed for expenses. And, and what are expenses? Rent, I have to have a place to live. I have to have food to eat. I have to have clothes to wear. Mm. I think that the Law Commission have explicitly advised against offering money for say rent but as you, as you say it, it's as long as a piece of string what reimbursement looks like so it's very easy to actually pass money under the table is is another risk to surrogates also the fact that there's clearly an incentive to um the space births closely if you're making money and if you're having c-sections you know I, I when I had a c-section I was advised to wait at least 18 months before getting pregnant again um but yeah. I guess if you need the money you might not do that and that must increase the risks as well yeah, there there is the risk that you know overwhelmingly surrogates are higher rates of C-section, and that could be because they're already in high rates. You know, one of the women I interviewed in one of my documentary films, you know, she had severe preeclampsia. I mean, she was on the border of having a stroke because her blood pressure was so high, and she was you know very premature, and so she had to have an emergency C-section. So there's there's C-section that just comes with the, the complications of the pregnancy. Sometimes there's C-sections because it's convenience. The intended parents are in town. Your due date has come. We've traveled from Spain. You know we want to get back home. You're you're you know you're past your due date. Let's have a C-section. You know because it's it's sort of convenience. Um, then there's the dreaded Drew at Bar Barlow's, you know, are famous couple in, um, I guess they're no longer a couple, but they were for many years a couple. And, um, and I think one of them was bold enough to say on camera that they wanted their surrogates to have C-section because they didn't want their children to touch a dirty vagina. Mm-hmm. <laughs> so this that whole layer of, you know, hatred towards women or, you know, treating us as, you know, chattel. Um, it's, it's, so there's, you know, it's, and I look at the United States, I, I'm sorry, I'm not up to speed on, um, you know, your maternal health and morbidity rates, but, you know, the United States is such a wealthy, wealthy country. We still have horrible data as it relates to women, you know, pregnant mothers and, and complications and even death. So, but, you know, I think we've had six or seven U.S. surrogates that have died that we know about. And mm-hmm. the tragedy is the only reason we even find out that these women die is almost always because somebody sets up a GoFundMe and you'll see a GoFundMe that's been set up for the surrogate who died. And we're trying to raise money for the grieving husband or the, the children that lost their mother. You know, the most recent one was a Jane Doe. They wouldn't publish her name, but she was a single mom with, uh, th- I think, three children, two or three children. So the GoFundMe was set up for these children that, you know, were you know basically orphaned. And it was funny because the surrogate agency was called Family Makers. Mm. <laughs> And I'm like, no, yeah. they're orphan makers. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I presume as well that there are other, um, there are lots of other objections that one can make to the surrogacy industry aside from safety. Um, which to your mind are the most pressing objections? You've, you've said that you, it's not a matter of just regulating it and, and giving surrogates more rights. You really think that the whole industry actually um, needs to be done away with. Maiden Mother Matriarch is brought to you by Keeper, the world's most advanced matchmaking solution. Now, many of you will know that I'm normally extremely suspicious of dating apps like Tinder and Bumble, which tend to produce repeat customers who must endure endless, miserable hookups and short-term relationships without ever finding a spouse. Well, Keeper is a completely different kind of service. Its algorithm prioritizes immediate attraction, but also, crucially, long-term compatibility, because forever is the goal. Everyone in the Keeper matchmaking pool is there because they want to find a spouse. Using psychometric tests like Big Five, 
IQ and masculine and feminine polarity, Keeper can accurately predict who you're going to have the strongest chemistry with. The platform only gives you a match if you are an exact fit psychometrically and if the match offers everything that you've told Keeper you're looking for in a partner. It won't waste your time with only good enough matches like other dating apps and matchmaking services as well. So find your Keeper at Keeper.ai. That's K-E-E-P-E-R dot A-I. Yeah. I mean, I, when I talk to people, I always say there's plenty about surrogacy for everyone to find something to dislike about it. You know, whether you are, you know, I'm a big, you know, I was a pediatric critical care nurse for many, many years. So I'm a big supporter and champion of maternal child bonding Um, and maternal child bonding happens in utero. It doesn't happen magically. Once you bring the baby home, then you all bond. You know, we know um, that, babies bond with their mother in the womb. Um, and that connection is, is a good connection. And then in surrogacy arrangements, we just sort of magically want to say, well, it doesn't matter over here. Well, nobody's asked the baby. And we know just from adoption research that there's a lot of trauma in separating birth mothers and, and children, even though we know adoption has to happen sometimes because people can't, for m- many reasons, can't care for their children. Um, women aren't doing this for free. I mean, we saw that on full display in New York City, New York State, which recently legalized commercial surrogacy because after the baby M case, no commercial surrogacy was allowed. Only the altruistic model was allowed. And the the key signer, the senator of New York, who is a gay man who has a husband, complained that he and his husband had to come to California twice to pay women to be surrogates so that they could have children. And it was a supply and demand issue. He said, women are not willing to do this for free. And yes, most women are not willing to carry a nine month pregnancy um, just because they're a nice person. Unlike organ donation, where people will altruistically donate a kidney or you know, some kind of a tissue or blood. So, you know, between the health risks, the maternal child bonding, the the disregard for the baby, the commercial aspect of it, um, I always read surrogate contracts when surrogate women contact me if they get into trouble or have complications, you know, to read a contract that these women sign. Most of them are 60, 70, 80 pages long, which most women, if you're not savvy, you know, how can you slog through that long of a contract and really understand what all this means? And the attorney that is executing the contract represents the purchasing side of the equation. So they're not the they're not the lawyer who's re, who's representing the surrogate and making sure that she's protected. And you know, contracts always have um, termination clauses where um, the language is very. If the intended parents just want you to terminate the pregnancy, you must terminate the pregnancy doesn't have to say because life of the mother or life of the child, just because we've changed our mind or we're getting a divorce. Now there was one surrogate, the couple decided to divorce while she was pregnant. And so they wanted her to terminate um, the pregnancy. Um, They always have reduction clauses. So, you know, two women in California were pregnant with triplets and the, the intended parents wanted them to reduce down the pregnancy because they didn't want three babies. Um, they have everything from what you can eat, what you can drink, if you can dye your hair. You know, one woman, her contract required her to eat a vegan diet for nine months because the parents that hired her wanted her to eat a vegan diet. Um, one woman signed away her end of life decision making. So mm-hmm. if she was in an accident during the pregnancy, the intended parents who she'd never met, they didn't know her, had authority to make end of life decision to withdraw life support or leave her on life support you know it's just is that I mean is that legal for them to, to... it's not illegal mm. you know um it's not right <laughs> but you know when there's no law against it and that's what one, one thing that they say about California being the exemplar you know sort of the poster child for how to do it we have these ironclad contracts we have all this regulation but it doesn't protect the women and it certainly doesn't protect the children one you know we have the chinese come in droves to california because all surrogacy is illegal in china you cannot buy eggs in china the chinese are very very wealthy and one whistleblower contacted me um 
And she was over the VIP clients for the San Diego agency, which meant she handled all the Chinese because they were the VIP. They come with buckets of money. And she said, it's not uncommon for the Chinese to get three women pregnant at the same time. And then once the pregnancies are all confirmed and ultrasounds say twins or single or boys or girls, then they'll ask two of the three surrogates to terminate. Wow. Because there's it's it's really high failure rate. IVF has a very high failure rate. So they're just trying to get, you know, expedite the getting the baby. Well, let's get three women pregnant and then we'll see what happens. And hopefully, you know, we'll get a baby that we can take back to China. Mm. The argument that you'll often hear from people who um, maybe they're a little bit squeamish about the surrogacy, but um, they don't want to be completely anti. They'll say, look, I don't like the idea of sort of Indian baby farms where you've got really poor women basically imprisoned and, and and all of this you know I don't like that clearly there is an issue with you know if you have any objections to people buying and selling kidneys then you really ought to have objections to people buying and selling babies and 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 the use of women's wombs you know fine but people will say what about altruistic arrangements you know what about if it's a sister what about you know you can't you can't just uh oppose the sort of organic free range version of surrogacy just because there's a, there's a, there's a bad side to it. Do you find that argument convincing at all? Yeah, I get that a lot. Why can't a sister help her sister, your best friend, you know, give your sister some of your eggs or or have a baby for her. Um, You know, that doesn't whisk away the health complications. It doesn't risk away the, the risk to, you know, so you want to risk your sister's health or your best friend's health. Um, it doesn't take away from the fact that this baby has grown in this woman's womb and then is you know, traumatized by being separated. Uh, I have interviewed many people that have done that, you know, not, they were not paid, you know, one woman in one of my films, she was the surrogate for her, her gay brother and his partner. Um, she was the gestational surrogate because she, they didn't use her egg because it did, would be too incestuous, you know, to have her brother's sperm in her egg. Um, and she wasn't paid, you know, because she was helping her brother and she gave birth to twins. One, she almost died. She It was very high risk, complicated pregnancy. She delivered prematurely. So the, you know, the babies were very fragile and in the neonatal ICU for many, many months so they could be sent home. And she and her brother don't even speak. You know, so the whole dynamics of the family have just broken down. Um, you know, my book <clears throat> with Renata Klein and... Um, Melinda Tankard Rice out of spin effects is called Broken Bonds, Mother, Surrogate Mothers Speak Out. And there's quite a few stories in there of women who were surrogates for friends or family members. And, you know, it's it, it's, you know, it's just a broken relationship. It's shattered. And part of it is just human nature and the jealousy. You know, this woman was able to provide a child for me and I wasn't able to do it, you know, and there's there's sort of a jealousy. Um, there's a resentment. There's a well, we've got what we've got now. Can you just please go away? Um, which is why a lot of people want these contracts and they just hire a woman that they don't really intend to have any kind of relationship with because it just muddies the muddies the arrangement. So, you know, yeah. Do you want to ask your friend or your sister to do something that might end up, you know, causing her to lose her life or having your relationships forever damaged and fractured, you know, not to say that that always happens, but it's, you know, it's like anything else. We don't tell people go ahead and smoke because most smokers don't get lung cancer. You know, we say don't smoke because you might get it. And it really is awful if you get it. Um, So it's like, you know, maybe this arrangement with your family and your sister will work out well and no complications, no health complications. Everybody will be all lovey dovey together afterwards. But do you want to take that risk um, and have to live with the consequences of that for the rest of your life? And what do we want the state to condone as well? Because part of what government policy says is, is this is the model we think you should be following. And if at the moment, I mean, what we're doing in the UK and what seems to be happening all over the place is a push towards greater and greater um, liberalism on on, on surrogacy, you know, implicitly saying this is good. We want our citizens to be doing this. And as you say, there are just so many, so many negative outcomes for for surrogate mothers and and to the babies. So we know, don't we, that the we can measure the stress in newborns who are taken away from the women who've just given birth to them. Um, do we know anything about what kind of long-term consequences are that there are for the children of these arrangements? 
This is a moving target because, you know, assisted reproductive technology is still relatively new technology. And in order to have good data, you need, you know, large sample size and you need to follow the subjects of the study over time, um, which is why we're just now starting to get studies out on surrogate pregnancies and the complications that we're seeing in there, because we're doing it more regularly now since the baby N kind of case. And, you know, we're, you know, we, we're three decades out and we've got a lot more women that we can now, you know, gather data. The same is true of children that are born through assisted reproductive technologies. And this is just in general, like even if you and your husband or your partner, you know, do IVF with your own egg and your own sperm, but you use assisted reproductive technology, um, we're seeing now that the children born of these technologies, whether it be surrogacy or just egg donation or a regular old husband and wife, um, we're seeing that the, the children of these uh, arrangements, these high tech pregnancies are having complications. And it's it's an evolving story, um, again, because we're following and looking and gathering more data. Um, but because these children are often born um, prematurely, and they're often born when, when you're premature, you're low birth weight. So all the complications that come with prematurity and low birth weight, which are immediate short-term complications, and there also can be complications you know, down the road based on the fact that you were born really tiny as a preemie. Um, there's stuff in the literature about children having certain, uh, being at higher risk for certain genetic diseases. Uh, two of the one, the genetic diseases that I've seen reported are, you know, Beck with Wedemann syndrome and um, Angelman syndrome. So it's just kind of like, hmm, I wonder why this is. There was something that came out in my inbox last week. It was a new study that showed um, we it 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 was comparing lesbian couples who are just using sperm donation. You know, lesbian couples need a sperm. They usually have the egg and they usually have the womb. Um, but they were showing that lesbian couples to having children through sperm donation, which is kind of low tech, you can just do artificial insemination, you don't have to do IVF, um, have lower, these children have lower rates of these complications than the children that are made through IVF. Um, and this, this study was actually raising a question I've been wondering about for a long time. Is it the technique, the actual technique of making these little embryos in the lab and then transferring them? Or is it the fact, here's a couple that otherwise couldn't conceive and we've ignored the fact that um, mother nature or evolution or whatever, that there's some, you know, fertility flaw in this couple for some reason, they, and that we've forced them to have children. So, you know, again, we're, you know, we're experimenting on these children. They're the subjects of this human experiment, you know, that we're just doing without their permission. Um, and I, I just often wonder, I often wonder about the complications of egg donors you know, and my colleagues and I did a, one uh, publication in a journal, and it was just a case report of five otherwise healthy young women who got breast cancer as very young women. And um, the one thing they had in common is they were all don egg donors. So they'd taken, you know, high dose fertility drugs to donate their eggs. And we know that egg donors are heavily screened out for history of cancer. Nobody's going to buy a woman's egg who checks. Yes, I have a history of cancer. Yes, I have a history of breast cancer. So what was, was, you know, huh, curious to us. Why would these women who are otherwise healthy develop a breast cancer that doesn't affect your usually young women? You know, it's a breast cancer that affects women 40s and 50s and 60s. Um, so I just wonder how many women out there now who have some kind of a breast or reproductive ovarian cancer you know, were, have a history of surrogacy, egg donation, or even IVF on their own, taking fertility drugs on their own. There's so much unknown, um, which as a nurse really troubles me because of the issue of informed consent and the collusion of informed consent in the case of third party with money. Yeah. The fertility drugs you take for, um, uh, for, for, for egg donation are really intense. I mean, some women, um, I've had this conversation a couple of times actually in the podcast recently with um, with Simone Collins and Diana, Diana Fleischman and um, both who have been through IVF. And, you know, for some women find it okay, it's not necessarily quite as physically difficult as you'll sometimes hear. But it is strange. You know, I had a friend who went through the um, egg collection process and she said the day before 
her eggs were retrieved. She felt as if her ovaries were like heavy. She was walking around with her whole kind of lower body feeling like bizarre because yes, the drugs you're pumping into your system are, are extreme. And it doesn't surprise me to be honest, the idea that it might have some effect on cancer rates in, in um, the breasts and ovaries given just given the experimental nature of it. it. It's terribly rough on your body. Um, you know, my first film that I wrote, directed and produced all on my own, is called Egg Exploitation. And two of the women in that film um, suffered massive stroke because the ovaries do get so swollen, like the size of cram, um, grapefruits. And, there's, and the reason they're swollen is there's so much fluid, you know, and fluid has to go somewhere. And oftentimes it causes stroke in the brain because you just, you know, you'll see the women talking about how they feel like they're eight and nine months pregnant. One of the women in the film said she felt like her ovaries were, she could feel them like sloshing around in her abdomen. Mm -hmm. Um, But two of the women had massive strokes immediately and they've lost their ability to have their own children because their stroke, Mm -hmm. you know, damaged the part of the brain that controls women's, our cycles. I mean, it's all controlled in our brain when, when we release the hormones and when we have our monthly cycle. So these women lost the ability to, to have children ever. And they know that they have children out there from their eggs, you know, which is kind of a, a, a sort of a double sadness to know that my children are out there somewhere. <laughs> yeah. I constantly get targeted advertising telling me to donate my eggs. Yeah. Um, yeah, pretty online. smart, talented. <laughs> There's yeah. some algorithm, I guess. I mean, the yeah, the the um, the class politics of this are quite uh, striking, right? Like egg donors, um, are Oxbridge Ivy League, educated, sporty, all this, you know, all this stuff that that people look for. You know, everyone's a eugenicist when they're choosing an egg donor, right? Um, yeah. whereas surrogates tend to are much more likely to be. Uh, poor women potentially from the third world like at the other end of the socioeconomic scale because they're just seen as being the carriers um yeah yeah, it's a really it's really grim when you look at it close up yeah in the in the u.s it's largely um surrogacy is largely targeted to military wives you know low-income stay-at-home moms working class kind of people even our own research one of the questions in our our study was on their finances um, and, you know, we don't have the poverty in the U.S. like they have in third world countries like, you know, Nepal or or um, India. But the women in our study were still in the lower tax tiers and they were they were partnered with men that either had college, you know, like an AA degree. I don't know what that translates to in in the United Kingdom, but just a couple years of college or just high school graduates. So, you know, they're not Ivy League educated professional people. Um, which which sort of makes sense because who do you see on the the magazine? Do you see the celebrities? You know, you see you know Lance Black just had another baby with his partner, you know, Daly, and you know they just had another baby through surrogacy. It's the glitterazzi, you know, that can can buy, um, and it's the working class or the you know even the the pretty girls on college campuses they're broke, you know, or they have debt. Yeah, yeah. So your perfect egg donor is only. It's an undergraduate baby. Yeah. Um, yeah. And she's got all sorts of stuff on paper that that can um that can appeal to buyers, but she's actually young enough that she needs the money and yeah. probably isn't really thinking about things like increased cancer risk later on or how she might feel psychologically to know down the track that she has children out there that she may never meet, particularly if she can't have children herself. I mean, I think that's the sort of thing that when you're 19 or 20, you just don't really think about. Um which is why we ought to have guardrails in place to protect people from making decisions that are going to hurt them later on. Right. Which really upsets me when I look at medicine and the profession. Um, and, you know, I, I actually got involved in the, the transgender debate kind of, you know, I don't know if it was serendipitously or, but when I found out the children in the U S before they block their puberty or before they if they've already gone through puberty before they put them on cross sex hormones are offered fertility preservation. So say you're a little boy or young boy that wants to transition to being a woman, they say, would you like to freeze and bank your sperm? So that when you grow up, if you want to have children and you're now living and presenting as a woman, you can go back to the sperm bank 
and get your sperm. So at least she can have a child that's genetically related to you. And the same with little girls. Would you like to freeze and make your eggs before you transition to living and presenting your life, you know, as a man? And I just became unglued um, because I thought, well, one, how can children even imagine or think about having children themselves when they're just children? <laughs> and they, they, even if you told them that, you know, IVF is really onerous it has a high failure rate and very expensive. And uh, it's not just, you know, oh, magically, oh, now I can have my children. Um, and the only demographic that we have in fertility preservation in minors is children, pediatric cancer patients. So if the, the child has a, a cancer and whatever chemo radiation therapy, they're going to offer this child, if they think it's going to damage their fertility, their future fertility, then they will offer that to these you know, adolescent children, cancer patients, but even then it's experimental. I mean, it's the medical literature says it's experimental and we don't have a lot of data of young children, cancer patients who said yes to fertility preservation and then went on and actually were successful and had children. So, you know, we're offering these children as part of their transition, their affirmation care, um, sort of high in the sky. Yeah. I mean, similarly, I would say that the fertility packages that are now being offered by a lot of um, corporate employers, where they will offer um, female employees egg freezing, um, or they'll offer surrogacy. Um, I think this was initially something that became popular in Silicon Valley, and it's now spread to London, and you can find it in 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 finance um, yeah. organizations and so on. And I think honey, they're not doing it for you. <laughs> you know, yeah. No employer is offering to pay for egg freezing just like for your own good, your own well-being. They're doing yeah. it in the hope that you will delay starting a family because they know that once you do, you're going to offer them, you're going to be, a, a, you know, a substandard employee in a whole bunch of ways. And so they're hoping that you'll put it off. And if you get there and actually the eggs aren't viable or you haven't found a partner or you know, any of these million of millions of things that can go wrong, which mean that you don't actually end up having children at all. Your employer isn't going to care. They're not going to be there. You know, then like there's, they're not going to be there to answer to you for having encouraged you down this, yeah. down this path. Well, and you know, I'm in the backyard of the Silicon Valley. So all of the big tech companies offer, not all of many of them. I have to check. Cause I actually showed my film exploitation at, at Google. So on the Google campus, I showed the film and I was able to talk with some of the, you know, pretty high up leadership people at Google. And at the time they were not offering fertility preservation to their female employees as a benefit. And I strongly encourage them not to, because you're basically, you know, risking your young female employees health. And, you know, you're giving them again, false assurance that, that this is insurance on their fertility. Um, so I'll have to go back and visit with them and see if, it's still not because everybody else like Apple and LinkedIn and Facebook, you know, I think Zoom, even, you know, we're on the Zoom platform. I, you know, I think they offer this as a paid benefit to their female employees. And people mm -hmm. think it's good because they're, well, I go, why won't you just read and, and understand that it's one, it's risky to women's health. And, and two, it has a high failure rate. <laughs> it's like, it has incredibly high failure rate. There are so many ads that I see as well on the on the tube in London um, for IVF clinics and egg freezing and all this stuff. And and the way they present the data, I know enough about this topic to know that the way they're presenting it is misleading because they don't tend to give the figures on live births. They'll give figures on pregnancies. Yeah. Miscarriage rates are so high that actually, you know, when you look at the number of live births resulting from every IVF cycle, it's really low, particularly if your infertility is age related rather than some kind of primary infertility affecting you when you're younger. Yeah. And mo most people don't realize live birth, all the definition of a live birth means a baby was born alive in the delivery room and could have taken one breath and then died. But it counts as a live birth because it was delivered. The baby was delivered alive. And a lot of babies are delivered alive and then go on within, you know, minutes or hours can die because they're born premature or with all kinds of complications, but it still gets, you know, a little tick that it was a live birth. So I always, you know, caveat live birth rates is, does not mean a live healthy baby that went home and grew up and lived a long life. Um, now, a lot of live births do, but it's not an assurance because we're not counting, you know, after, you know, minutes later or 
you know, hours later. And we know a lot of babies, you know, die within a few minutes or hours after delivery because they were born so premature or with severe complications. So I just don't think people actually know this. There was a there was a um a controversy in the UK recently when the um I can't remember her title, but the head of a Cambridge Women's College or until recently yeah. a women's college um, gave a speech to her students and said, look, I waited, you know, until late in life to have a baby. And and I actually didn't realize how difficult it would be to conceive naturally and all of this. And and sort of you, you should know this kind of method. And the overwhelming response in the newspapers, and I think for most of the students, was how patronizing. Of course, we know this, you know, you can't go anywhere without being told about the the, the ticking biological clock and all of this but I don't think that's true I don't think that I think people know it vaguely but I don't think that actually there's anything like the health literacy that people need in order to be making informed choices about reproduction yeah and you know to the I I love to beat up on big fertility because I think there's part of the problem that we have um in fertility medicine which really should be good proper fertility medicine but you know way back when the american society of reproductive medicine which is our big professional body over fertility medicine they had a huge campaign that was really educating women on the biological clock and they got smacked down by like the national organization for women you know, how dare you tell women when to have their children? How dare you tell women? You know, it was seen as, you know, a misogynistic patriarchy, you know, kind of, you know, overwhelmingly, you know, fertility medicine then was doctors that were men. You know, how dare you men tell women what to do with their bodies? And so they they backed off. They said, okay, well, that's, you know, we can't educate people. So I don't want to blame them for everything because they did. And I have the, you know, the slogans and the flyers and, you know, the campaign that they were driving, um, you know, to try to warn, warn women, educate women that, you know, your fertile years are, they're, they're bracketed. There's a great book called Motherhood Deferred. And it's, you know, one woman's story of, you know, waiting and career and contracepting and, you know, on and on and on. And just thinking that when she turned that light switch on, you know, that the baby would come. And of course the baby didn't come. Um, so she's just sort of wrote her story. Uh, and I think it's, it's, it's great because it's a firsthand account, you know, from a woman, you can't deny that. But I am amazed with how smart women are today, but when it comes to their fertile reproductive bodies, they are not very, you know, aware of what's going on and, and how to take care of their and preserve it. You know, fertility is very fragile. Um, I think smart people are particularly good at um, lying to themselves. <laughs> There's actually, I think there is actually um, research on this showing that the more intelligent you are, the better able actually you are to sort of construct um, narratives in your head and come up with sort of alternative scenarios and so on to justify whatever uh -huh. choice you're making and when you're in a really difficult situation I mean overwhelmingly I'd say the women that I know who've deferred motherhood it's almost always either because they can't find the right man and or it's because career makes it too difficult and if that's the situation you're in which an awful lot of women are in that situation it's really painful I think um being completely honest with yourself and really facing up to fertility science is not welcome. That's actually a, that's actually a hard thing to do, and you're not going to want to do that. Much easier to do as now did and say, you know, don't control our bodies. This patriarchal medical establishment or whatever yeah. is the problem, rather than look actually, you know, we 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 can do some amazing things with medical science, but actually extending the fertility window by much is something that we haven't really been able to to do. Yeah. And, you know, it's, we have this funny relationship with technology, you know, that will, it will solve all of our problems and provide everything that we need. Um, and it just, it doesn't, it doesn't work that way. And, you know, I mean, we have a million frozen human embryos in the United States. I think the United Kingdom has well over north of 2 million, um, you know, in this huge enterprise. I, I, I often say that the, the whole area of fertility medicine is sort of the, the largest social experiment of our time that we're just sort of, you know, pl play acting in as, you know, as it all unfolds. Um, you know, we had a case in the U.S. a few weeks ago where a couple adopted two frozen embryos 
that were created and frozen before the couple who adopted them had even been born. Wow. That's you, really, have to stop. Yeah. you have to, it's like, you need like a little chart and you kind of go, is it okay to freeze human embryos for 20 plus years? I mean, will those, we don't know, will those children be fine? Will they, you know, will, 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 will there be any, you know, negative outcome that we'll see down the road that we didn't understand at the time that maybe you can't freeze a tiny little embryo for 20 years and thaw it out. And then, you know, poof, it's all okay. I don't know. It's, but it's just weird. This- it's weird how much risk tolerance there is when it comes to big fertility and then yeah. how much risk aversion there is when it comes to every other area of pregnancy. Like I was reminded having horrible hay fever this week that hay fever season before last, I was pregnant. And so I couldn't take an antihistamine because it says on the label, you can't take an antihistamine when you're pregnant, yeah. uh, along with basically everything else, blue cheese, you know. And um, so when it comes to that, we're super, super, super cautious to the point of actually causing pregnant women unnecessary misery often. And but, and yet we do completely wild things with whatever frozen embryos. Or what was the case in Spain at the moment that's been in the news about this um, woman in her 60s who sort of wheeled out of hospital carrying a baby? Yeah. But, yeah. Well, she's, again, she's a celebrity um, and she's 68 years old. Apparently her son had cancer and, you know, died. It was terminal cancer. He died. He, they froze his sperm um, and banked it. His dying wish was to have children. Um, well, he, obviously he's dead. He doesn't have children. His child was born. And the the 68 year old celebrity, um, I'm certain had to buy eggs. She was too old to provide her own eggs and she wouldn't want to have a, a child with her son's sperm. Um, she hired a, a surrogate mother in Miami, Florida, and no no idea where the um, egg donor came from. It could have been a U.S. egg donor or somewhere in somewhere else. And the surrogate gave birth to a, I believe, it was, yeah, the little girl, um, the end of March. And of course, all of surrogacy is illegal in Spain, so that immediately, you know, made big news in in the headlines in Spain because, you know, she's a celebrity. And she was able to do that, you know, come to the U.S. Um, and, you know, it added a wrinkle because she did use her her dead son's sperm. Um, but she's not saying she's this is her daughter. She's saying she's the grandmother. So she basically contracted to, you know, have a grandchild born. And, you know, I, you know, I've been to Spain many times and shown my my surrogacy films there. I've met with all members of the European the Spanish parliament. Um, from the Socialist Party to the Green Party, you know, and I told them your law is wonderful, but you need to keep the Spanish people from coming to the United States or to the Ukraine. You know, it needs to be a law that doesn't, you know, you obviously don't want women in Spain to be harmed or exploited, but you need to make sure that your you know, citizens can't come. Um, you know, Kelly Martinez in my film, Big Fertility, the surrogacy, that she did that almost cost her her life was for a Spanish couple in Spain and the Spanish couple, she gave birth to twins and the Spanish couple came and took the twins back to Spain and never bothered to pay Kelly's hospital bills. So she had $11,000 of unpaid medical bills as somebody who was in a high risk pregnancy, had to have an emergency C-section to deliver 10 weeks premature twins, you can imagine what kind of fees you would rack up in that kind of a scenario being in, in a hospital. And the fertility agency that the Spanish couple worked with in the United States said, well, we can't, we can't get them to pay. You know, they're in Spain. We, you know, they won't answer our emails. They won't pick up a phone call. And so I brought Kelly to Spain with me and she spoke in the uh, parliament there in Madrid and she called the agency in the United States the day before she got on the plane to fly to Spain with me. And she told the agency she was going to Spain to speak to the parliament and the agency paid all of her bills the next day. Mm -hmm. And meanwhile, she had for an, a, over a year, she had creditors knocking on her door saying, you have unpaid bills. Her credit was ruined. You know, mm -hmm. you get in the U S we have credit ratings based on how you, you pay your bills on time. Um, and they had the money and they wouldn't pay because they thought, well, we can just string this poor little woman along, just tell her there's nothing we can do. And then the next day they paid all the bills when they found out she was going to go to Spain. Well, that's the thing about America that's, you know, at the vanguard of the surrogacy industry and also um, women get into horrific debt just from having children. 
it's in the UK. You, it's all for free. it's all free. You don't have to pay to give birth. Yeah, um, yeah, that's the thing. <laughs> yeah, that's the thing about um, state of American feminism. Extremely patchy, to put it mildly. Um, what's the situation in Italy at the moment? Um, surrogacy is a very contentious issue there as well, isn't it? In in the law, Italy has a law very similar to Spain. Um, where is all surrogacy is illegal in Spain? Um, it's weird because women can be paid for their eggs, which I don't get why why that is. But the, you know, the current prime prime minister is trying to um, do what I encourage the Spanish to do: make it so that Italians cannot leave and go to other countries and hire surrogates. Um, so she's wanting to criminalize it. You know, and so it will be a deterrence for people who can't do surrogacy in Italy to not be able to do, you know, to leave their, you know, their country and come to America or Ukraine or other places where markets open. So I say brava, you know, to her. Um, you know, it's it's of course it's presenting itself in a little bit of a political, you know, conundrum because she's very conservative, very right. And there's, you know, obviously very liberal, radical feminist groups who a hundred percent. Um, want surrogacy abolished so it's one of those where they're kind of having to quietly <laughs> support the prime minister that they normally don't like her policies on other kind of socially conservative issues so it's you know it's creating you know interesting bedfellows there but I'm I'm told by people um, that I work with and colleagues in Italy that it's got a good shot of passing that mm. she, you know she would be successful in criminalizing Italians from leaving Italy to rent wombs and buy babies so I believe it's something that she mentioned she she mentioned in her stump speech when she was running. And I'm I'm no expert on uh, George Maloney or Italian politics in general. But um my understanding is that calling her right or far right isn't isn't quite right because yes, she is socially conservative on things like surrogacy and yeah. she's pro marriage and whatever, although I think she's herself a single mother. Um but she's quite left economically. Um mm. she's she's basically just Catholic. She has Catholic sort of yeah. Um, yeah. social positions on everything, which, you know, makes sense in Italy. Yeah. Um, yeah. <laughs> do you think actually, I mean, thinking about both Spain and Italy, do you think that there is generally more resistance to surrogacy in countries that have historically been Catholic, even if now they're, they've become much more secular? Well, I don't know. I mean, Germany, I don't think of as being a terribly religious Catholic country. And, you know, all surrogacy and egg, egg selling is illegal in Germany. Um, a lot of the, you know, um, Sweden, uh, I guess you could quibble on Fr France's history, the, the rich, if there is a religious history in France, but, you know, France frowns upon and doesn't allow surrogacy either. Um, so, I don't know. I mean, it's, it's certainly not the case in the United States. I mean, I have been in the most red, red, red of states that are deeply socially conservative religion. I remember testifying at a hearing in South Dakota. And I remember it because it was Ash Wednesday because all the senators had ashes on their forehead. And I was testifying, asking them to um, pass a law that would prohibit commercial surrogacy. And South Dakota is a state that doesn't have any language. It doesn't have any law on surrogacy. Um, and I thought, isn't this interesting? And they, they, the majority voted against the bill because if we can't pay women, how are all these other families who testified today with their cute little babies on their hip with their surrogates in tow saying it was such a wonderful thing? They were incredibly sympathetic to the people who couldn't have children if not for this wonderful woman. And it just struck me as, wow, this is... Because if you can't pass a law that prohibits paying women to rent their wombs <laughs> in a very, you know, red conservative pro-life, you know, pro-traditional family, you know, you know, state. I just thought this is interesting. I find and, you know, a lot yeah. of surrogates in the U.S. are, are deeply religious pro-life women by their own identification. So... Yes, as you mentioned, it, it sort of makes sense that military wives would be drawn to this partly because of um, often being poor and being and and being um, stay-at-home moms, but also because they probably have that sense of duty and wanting to, you know, so much of the of the of the discourse around this is about yeah. being generous and you know the, the repeated use of the word altruist and so on. Um, 
But I, I, I mean, even aside from the fact, as you mentioned earlier on, that so many of these contracts have built in the fact that that surrogates are obliged to have abortions if the if the intended parents tell them to, essentially, which seems like it would be a real problem for um, a pro life Christian surrogate. There, there must be cases where the women just refuse to do it, and then you end up with legal wranglings. Yeah, the two women in the in California that were asked to reduce down their triplet pregnancies didn't do it. Um, you know, we had to help them find pro bono legal aid um, to sort of stand with them because they were being bullied and intimidated. You were in breach of your contract. You'll have to pay all the money back. Um, you'll have to keep the baby, you know, all these kind of things that they sort of put pressure on the women. Um, it's not so bad in the U.S. that we're strapping women down against their will and enforcing them to terminate their pregnancies. Um, but the reality is, is that most of the women, if they are intimidated or bullied like that, they comply, right? Because they go, oh my gosh, I'm going to have to pay the money back. Well, I've already spent the money paying my rent every month. Um, oh my gosh, I'm going to have to keep the baby. Well, I did this not to have another baby. I did this to make the money. Um, so yeah, I, but it's, it's really unfortunate that this language is in these contracts because most of the women, what they, they see is the big payday and how they need that money. And, you know, back to the smoker, it's probably not going to happen to me. Um, you know, I, I can't imagine that I'm going to be pregnant with triplets and that this is what they're going to do. You know, they're going to make me to do this. So they're just taking a gamble. And the reality is that these women, they don't know um, whatever became of the babies, which causes them more distress. Because here, you know, that you gave birth to three babies that the couple didn't want. And there's no reason why the couple, you know, couldn't give two of the babies away for adoption. Um, you know, we have states that are like safe. You can just drop a baby on the steps of the firehouse and no questions are asked, you know, sort of safe, safe haven laws that, you know, that they provide. And I think Arizona is one of those states that has a law like that so that women who deliver babies can just drop them off and walk away. Nobody has to ever know they had a baby. Um, but, you know, it causes them a lot of distress because here they were thinking this is a couple that wanted children. They wanted babies. Um, and now all of a sudden they want some of the babies, but not all of the babies. Do they, did they even keep them? Yeah. yeah. And what became of those babies? You know, were they sold in a baby farm? <laughs> you know. And, yeah. and what kind of parents are are these people that we would even want the you know these women to do? You know, one of the women she was pregnant with uh, twin boys and a girl, so the pregnancy was. Three babies, two boys, and the girl. and they wanted a boy and a girl. So they wanted her to terminate one of the boys. And because the boys were identical twins, they were in the same sack, right? And and it's really risky to go in and terminate a, a, a baby in that situation. And so that made the surrogate, even though she'd agreed to reducing down the pregnancy in her contract that she signed, it made her more um, uncomfortable with agreeing to do that. So it wasn't that she was against reducing down the pregnancy, you know, or uh, against terminating one of the, the uh, fetuses. It was just the risk that she was going to be putting two little boy embryos, you know, in harm's way because of the, the fact that, well, we want a boy and a girl. We only want two and we want one of each. And, you know, it was just that kind of pick and choose cafeteria I'll have the salad with, you know, Italian dressing that <laughs> just, just disgusted her. And you kind of have to think, well, who, what kind of people are these people going to be like as parents, you know, raising kids that, well, I really didn't want two of you, but I had, had to have two boys. I wanted a boy and a girl. Mm. It really does treat reproduction just like a, like a shopping experience. Yeah. And uh, yeah, and and also because like, come on, the, what's going on here is in the end human trafficking. Because what you're actually purchasing is the baby. You're not actually paying the woman to be pregnant. You know, even if you might give her money during her pregnancy, what you're actually paying yeah. for is for her to hand over this baby at the end of the process. And we have a word for that, you know. Yeah, and they say that in this this scenario of egg donation and in surrogacy, we're not paying the woman for her eggs. We're not buying eggs. 
we're not buying a baby. We're paying the woman for her time and her trouble. And I say, read the contracts. Every bit of the contract is if she doesn't comply, the money has to be paid back. You know, at the end of the pregnancy, if she decides I'm going to keep the baby, I changed my mind. You know, they come after and say, well, we want our money back. And I go, well, if you want your money back, that's means because you bought that baby. You know, that baby had a price tag on it. And if you're saying, I'm not going to give the baby over, you know, well, that's, that's the definition of buying and selling a baby. Um, Jennifer, I really want to talk in the extended bit of the episode in just a moment about some of the public responses that you've had to your campaigning work. Um, and I also want to talk about some of the public responses that I've, I've had to my writing about surrogacy, <laughs> um, which has been actually more fiery than on um, most other topics because it really touches the nerve. Um, but before we get to that, for um, for everyone else watching, where can people find more of your work and, and follow you online? Yeah, well, I'm very active on Twitter. So I'm, you know, at Jennifer Law on Twitter. And we have a, a big YouTube channel, the Center for Bioethics and Culture Network, which is our YouTube channel. So all the films that we've made are free on the YouTube channel for people to watch. Um, we've made two films on surrogacy, two on egg donation, one on sperm donation, um, and then two on the transgender issue. So, you know, find our work there if you want to watch our movies and they're free. So, you know, I'm not trying, not trying to sell anything here. Um, but yeah, that's where right. we hang out. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for watching that episode of Maiden Mother Matriarch and for all of your support. It means an enormous amount for the growth of the show. If you want to hear bonus content, an extra 20, 30 minutes of conversation with the guest, maybe a little bit more personal, a little bit less filtered, then you can go to my Substack at louiseperry.substack.com where you can sign up for extended episodes and also bonus episodes. And you can also access our chat community. You can also support the show by subscribing on YouTube or subscribing wherever you get your podcasts and rating and reviewing on Apple Podcasts is also really great for encouraging other people to give the show a try. Please also spread the word, tell people that you know who you think might like it to give it, to give it a shot. Um, the word of mouth effect is really valuable, so we'd really appreciate it. Thank you so much, everyone, for listening, watching and supporting what we're doing.